We have uh, two scripture readings today. The first one comes from Psalm 126. Hear the word of the Lord. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Second, Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The word of the Lord. Langston Hughes once wondered aloud, well, technically he wrote it down, But what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Or does it stink like rotten meat? Or crushed in sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? For many of us, we know the answer to Langston Hughes' question. Yes, our dreams dry out like raisins in the sun. Yes, they start to stink like rotting meat whenever we remember what we hoped for and did not achieve. And yes, they start to sag like a heavy load. I must confess, I do not like to dream, and I most certainly do not like to hope. Dreams leave me confused. I wake up thinking that it's Thursday when actually it's Tuesday, which means I forgot to turn in my paper, which was due on Wednesday. And now I'm out of the program and my second reader is furious at me. (laughs) Furthermore, I spend the rest of the day trying to figure out which day is which. They leave me confused, befuddled, and bamboozled. But I also don't like to hope, which is what Hughes is talking about, that, that feeling, that belief that things will get better, that tomorrow it'll be different. And you stand there hoping against all hope, like a sandcastle on the seashore, watching an endless battalion of waves approaching because you know the tide is coming in. <laughs> no thank you, no thank you. I do not like to dream. And I do not like to hope. I do not like it on a plane. I do not like it on a boat. I do not like to wait for hope. I do not like it. No, thank you. Nope. It's a Daniel Hill original. (laughs) Maybe it's just me. But I find that hoping is hard and terribly exhausting work. You're sitting here because somewhere along the way, you believed God was calling or leading or directing or sending you to get further studied so that you could be better equipped to serve his people. But now graduation is approaching, and you've got more rejection letters than you know what to do with. And you're thinking, where are you, God, and why on earth did you send me here? Or, or, or maybe that's not you. Maybe you're on the wrong side of 23, and you can see 30 off in the distance. And the younger version of you certainly thought we would be married, have one and a half kids and a dog in a house by now, but certainly not still in school. And this is only semester two. 
And you're sitting there watching, scrolling through your Facebook timeline as people leave you behind by the life stage, and you don't even know what that is yet. Or perhaps that's not you. Maybe you, you're sitting here and you've been praying for years for a loved one or family member to trust in Christ. And with each passing conversation, it's like that one little spark that was there gets snuffed out. And you're like, God, I know that the Bible says something about you and salvation and wanting it for people. But it seems like I care more about this than you do. And you just so desperately want them to trust in Christ. And they won't. Yes, life is hard and full of disappointment. There is no denying that. But we need to hope. And we need to know how to hope. You need this, graduate students and faculty alike. The scripture repeatedly tells us that hope is this gift from the great God of the gospel. And so while life is full of disappointment, we need to know how to navigate those frustrations and unmet expectations so that when our dreams dry out like raisins in the sun, we're not left with bitterness and rotting hearts. Saints, God's faithful acts demonstrate his character. And because of this, we can trust in him, we can cling to him, we can believe in him, and we certainly can look forward with hope. Psalm 126, our text for today, we will see that the psalmist teaches us how to cultivate hope. Because we have to learn to be a people of hope together. We must cultivate our imaginations as we expect and anticipate to bear witness to God's goodness as his servants, children, and friends. So as we walk through this text, I'm going to give you a what, a why, and a how. I'm going to tell you what to do, why to do it, and then the psalmist is going to tell us and teach us how. We're going to see that we are a people who must learn how to daydream. So this is your first lesson in hopology. So what is hope and what does it mean to hope? Well, first, I think it's a little helpful to talk about what hope is not. First, hope is not wishful thinking. That Thomas the Tank Engine mentality of I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, that might work great in the weight room, and it, it doesn't work that great there. But when circumstances are outside of your control, you can walk into that interview thinking you can all you want, all you want, but it's the, the interviewee who determines whether you can or can't have that job. Wishful thinking is trusting in the self, that if you just muster up, or as they say where I've lived, pull yourself up by your bootstraps quick enough, strong enough, and long enough, you'll get to where you need to go. But we're not the masters of our fate, nor the captains of our ships. But hope is also not a fleeting emotion based on the circumstances around us. I watch way too much basketball, and you'll see this with basketball players. They'll make a couple shots, and they'll think, oh, the next one certainly has to go in. Or they'll miss a couple and say, I'm not shooting for the rest of the game because 0 for 5 looks a lot better than 0 for 30. <laughs> but that's not what hope is either, because that's trusting in, in the universe or the circumstances around you as if they determine and dictate what happens next. But then hope is also not optimism. Optimism is this belief, not in the self or in the universe, but in time, that things will be better tomorrow based on the sure and certain principle that things get better. But we know that's not true, because someone's tomorrow involves the death of a friend, the loss of a loved one, cancer. No, that's not what we mean when we talk about hope. So if hope isn't wishful thinking, it isn't trusting in the self, and it's not optimism, what on earth is it? What are we talking about when we talk about hope? That's an incredible question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, hope is this confidence based on God's faithfulness. It is believing because God is faithful to his promises that we will see his goodness. One author has put it this way, hope is a conviction founded on God's fidelity. In other words, hope is rooted in the character and in the promises of God. Because we Christians just aren't a people who hope, according to the Psalms, according to the New Testament, we are a people who hope in God. We are a people who have seen God's goodness and believe that he is faithful. 
But then why must we hope and why on earth must we hope in God? I hope the second question answers itself. Knowing what we know about God, it makes sense to hope in him. But we hope in God because he's good. God is not vindictive, capricious, fickle. He doesn't need to have coffee before he can become like a relation, like someone you can relate to. The, and he's shown us this in Jesus, right? It's not that you always get what you want, but we do know that this God is good. We also hope in God because he's faithful. One of the things that amazes me about the scriptures is how God remembers the promises he made to Abraham and then fulfills them thousands and thousands of years later. But not just the promises to Abraham. He's also like, I'm going to keep the promises I made to David and the promises I made to Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these other people in between. And he's shown us this in Jesus, right? The seed of blessing, the king who's come to reign and establish his kingdom. And we, his people, can rejoice in this. But third, we must hope in God because we have been given the gift of hope. It sounds kind of circular. It probably is. But Ephesians 2 tells us that at one time we were without hope because we were without God. But now we are a people of hope because we are the people of God. On that blessed day when grace appeared, our lives were changed forever. So how foolish would it be to throw that away? So we've talked about what hope is and why we must do it. And that's all great. But how? How do we cultivate our hope? Because knowing what to do is great, but if you don't know how to do it, I haven't really helped you. Thankfully, we can turn to Psalm 126. And the psalmist teaches us that we have to cultivate our imaginations based on the faithfulness of God. We have to learn how to daydream. The psalm is broken down into three stanzas. The first three stanzas, he teaches us that we have to remember God's faithful acts of the past. We look back and remember that God has worked. The psalm begins with a trip down memory lane. And he says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, he has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. This isn't just, this isn't like he's just memor memorized some propositions and he's recalling them to mind. He, he engages his episodic memory. He goes to what it was like when he was there and, and sees the emotion, the, the gladness that they felt. That they were rejoicing so much that the neighboring nations came over and said, what is all this ruckus about? Their God has heard them. Nations that didn't acknowledge God acknowledged that God did something for them. God's restoration let them know that he was with them and for them. And, and I wonder how much time do we spend doing that? How much time do I spend complaining versus remembering that God is faithful and good? Because the Lord certainly has done great things for us. He sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive an adoption as sons that we did not labor for or earn. So the psalm asks us to remember Jesus. We must remember God's past redemptive acts. Because the God who has delivered us is the God who will deliver us. But I don't know if any pill is harder to swallow when you're in pain than remembering that God, God is capable of changing my situation. Why won't he do it now? <laughs> That's the question, right? That's the rub. Psalm help us, helps us out with that too. In verse 4, he teaches us that we must not only remember God's past redemptive acts, but we have to engage him in honest lamentation. He says, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams of the Negev. He uses the phrase, same phrase, when the Lord restored our fortunes, and he's asking God to do the same thing that he had done again. Continue, Lord, your past redemptive work. And he, he uses a simile like the streams of the Negev, a, a river that after the winter rains had come would overflow and abound and replenish other water sources, and the desert and barren ground around it would blossom with life. Because the image is, to, Lord, take what is broken and dead and barren and burst it forth with life. Because he already knows, based on God's history, what he's seen God do 
that God cares for him. So it's not too much to ask for him to fight on our behalf. And we must do the same. Because of Jesus, we can approach this God with boldness. And he's shown us so vibrantly. I love how invested God is in our prayers. You have the great high priest, Jesus, who intercedes. You have the Holy Spirit who intercedes with groans and utterances because we don't really know how to pray. And then you have the Father who was eagerly listening. So I I think he's earned the right for us to approach him with honesty. I mean, and that's a scary place to be because sometimes we like, get to the edge of blasphemy and start to lean over with as the anger bubbles out. But he's earned the right to hear our lamentation. But not only do we look back at his past redemptive acts, not only do we engage him with honest lamentation, but we have to cultivate our imaginations with the faithfulness of God. We have to begin to expect to see his goodness. The psalm starts or closes with this, Image of God's provision. And it hasn't happened yet, or he wouldn't have said in verse 4, restore our fortunes. But he says, those who go out sowing in tears will reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping because there is no food to eat and they're concerned about the future, one day they will see God's restoration and they'll come back with bundles, sheaves filled with grain. He begins to imagine, what might it look like for me to see God act? For me to see God's goodness. Now, don't forget this, again, hope is not wishful thinking, and it's not optimism, and it certainly isn't the prosperity gospel. So it's not that we are praying, Lord, I just, when I go to my seatbelt box this week, hmm, I need that ticket. I need that ticket, the winning lottery ticket, let it be there, because Sally Mae is coming for me July 1st. <laughs> no, that, that's, not, that's not what we're taught to do. I think it's more thinking along these lines. So for those of you who are approaching the 30 mark and wondering about your Facebook relationship status uh, thing, maybe it's how might God use this moment in my life to encourage someone else? Maybe it's someone who's recently widowed. Maybe it's someone who's wondering, can I do graduate work if I'm still a single man or woman? Does that just mean that it's over for me? I say, no, you will see God's goodness. Or perhaps you've been dreaming your whole life of serving the Lord overseas, and that door has been closed shut, and that saying that said he would open a window has not come to fruition. So you're just in a room with no, no air ventilation. But maybe it's saying, Lord, how might I serve you here? Maybe serve refugees from this country I've been longing to go to. Maybe you'll use me as a missionary here and now. Or to encourage others to go. Because hope forces the imagination to come up with alternatives. Because it's confident that we will see God's goodness. And in so doing, we are expecting God to act, which is a good expectation to have because then we give him credit when he does. A few years ago, I think it's coming up on five now. (laughs) Man, how time flies. Uh, My life began to crumble and fall apart. It was January 2013, and I was was in the zone. Athletes think there's a zone, but I was in it. Like, I was halfway through seminary. Greek was almost behind me. I was in that sweet spot between Greek and Hebrew. (laughs) Did not know what lay ahead. But I was in a promising relationship. I was saving up for an engagement ring. The church I was working at, the residual effects of the split had started to at least, you know, be brushed under the carpet. And I was enjoying it. And then it was like someone started to loosen the lug nuts on my life as I'm driving down the highway. I got a call from my aunt, or from my mother, telling me my aunt had, her cancer had returned. Two days later, she died. But I'm, you know, I'm a Midwesterner. We don't grumble, we grunt. So it's like, we got to keep it moving. It's only January. You gotta, you're wearing this for the long haul. Exposition papers are coming up. Keep it moving. And the young lady I was dating got into a fight with Poison Ivy and was homebound for a month. And then two weeks after that, I caught laryngitis, which lasted for a month. And then two weeks after that, I found out I was being sued. Went to visit a friend. She was like, oh, it's so good to see you. Here's a letter from... Uh, Civil court. 
But again, you know, I got I to gotta keep it moving. Two weeks after that, a young lady calls me up and says, hey, can we, can we talk? And being the highly intelligent, very skilled, relationally proficient man that I am, I was like, oh, she wants to have a conversation, of course. Not, oh, she wants to have the it's not me, it's you conversation. And I was a little blindsided. That's an understatement. I was struck. But again, you know, it's April, the first week of April. That exposition paper I should have done in January, it's due tomorrow. Got to keep it moving. Then I found out that I was being charged with a crime I had not committed and would be fired from my job indefinitely without pay. And all my friends started to kind of disapparate away because they didn't want to catch whatever it was that I was carrying. And I was angry. I was frustrated. I was embarrassed. For those of you who have never enrolled in a seminary, going to jail just does not help the ministry track a whole lot. I was like, how could God do this to me? I have my quiet times every morning for 30 minutes. I serve in a church. Why would you abandon me? <clears throat> month after month of legal proceedings, delay after delay. I'm like, Why won't you hear me when I cry out? I can remember when you've redeemed me in the past, and I'm engaging you with honest lamentation to the point where it's like, I'm pushing past the Habakkuk one kind of prayer and into the, like, let's get on with it. I've learned whatever lesson I was supposed to learn, God. Let's, let's get this over with. And I'm burning through my savings and wondering why he won't help me. As I checked myself in and out of jail, posed for mugshots, I didn't doubt that God couldn't provide. I just didn't understand why he wouldn't. Around the last week of September, after things had gotten delayed for the umpteenth time, I was getting ready to present my case before grand jurors. It's very hard to prove that you haven't done something. And as I was praying, I was forced to engage the possibility that I would spend the next 25 years in jail for something I had not done. And I was, as I'm wrestling with, like, will my pacifism hold up in prison? Like, how does that work out? Will I witness or just avoid people? Um, will I serve my God and king in jail? What if that's where he's sending me? The thought kind of hit me like, what if your seminary training was to minister to people in prison? What if that's the goodness of God that you see? Is he still worth serving? So I prayed. To be honest, Lord, I'm a little worried because I don't think it'll go my way. I know that you have used the season of hurt and pain to mold me. And so in light of this, I pray that scary and terrifying pray that your son, prayer that your son has prayed. Save me from this hour, but rather be glorified in this hour. Honor your name. Glorify your name. Lead men and women to fall down in worship of the living king. Hope forces the imagination to come up with alternatives. The next day, thanks be to God, my case was dismissed, my record was expunged, and I was in the most literal sense possible set free. Scarred, bruised, broken, and hurting, but free. And I can remember sitting on the floor of my house afterwards and weeping the Lord, the words, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. But even more than that, I can remember sitting in the Black Lab pub in downtown Houston, my friends David Gray, John Dang, Michael Marish, James Hogan, Chase Holt, and others, and declaring in so many words, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Hope forces our imagination to think of alternatives. And we have to learn how to daydream. So remember the past acts of God's faithfulness. Like really do the hard work of remembering. Cry out to him in honest lamentation. And look forward with hope. Because you will see God's goodness in anticipation of the resurrection. Ask the question, how might the Lord Restore my fortunes so that the nations burst, burst forth in praise. So that I realize, yes, he has done great things for us, and I am glad. Let me end with this prayer from St. Augustine. Will you pray with me? My God, let us know and love you so that we may find our happiness in you. Since we cannot fully achieve this on earth, help us to improve daily until we do so to the full. Enable us to know you ever more on earth so that we may know you perfectly in heaven. Enable us to love you evermore on earth, 
so that we may love you perfectly in heaven. In that way, our joy may be great on earth and perfect with you in heaven. O God of truth, grant us the happiness of heaven so that our joy may be full in accord with your promise. In the meantime, let our minds dwell on that happiness, our tongues speak of it, our hearts pine for it, our mouths pronounce it, our souls hunger for it, our flesh thirst for it, and our entire being desire it until we enter through death in the joy of our Lord forever. Amen. May the joy of the Lord sustain you. May the love of the Lord lead you. May the peace of the Lord guard you. And may you always remember, saints, beloved brothers and sisters, to hope in God. For though we do not see him, we know him. And though we do not see him now, we are filled with joy inexpressible and filled with glory. For we are obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Go with God.